So if you're in the market and you've seen things like gigahertz, speed, multi-cores, super threaded, hyper threaded, big names and gigahertz and all those kind of things, chances are you've gotten a little confused. And the question might have also arised, is it better to have more slower cores or fewer faster cores? Hey guys, Steve Morty here, back with another video, and we are here with the question, is it better to have more slower cores or less faster cores? Now, this has always been the case from the days that we went more than single core, so I guess we do have to start off with a few things. Number one being, not all CPU cores are created equal. For example, the ones from AMD are going to be completely different from the ones from Intel, so do keep in mind that if you're trying to compare the two different companies, it's probably not the best idea. Also, too, don't compare different generations because again, sometimes there can be fairly dramatic changes in the generations and well, you'll be comparing two different things. For example, a five-year-old Intel chip that runs at three gigahertz will be crushed or almost crushed by a two gigahertz CPU from today. Not only are we getting more cores in today's CPUs, but also two things like instructions per second and just overall better design are coming out in these new CPUs. So if it's an older CPU, try not to compare it with a new one because there's newer technologies coming out, but all those technologies and things found and new computers will be featured in another video coming down the line. So with that being said, let's get into some testing and scenarios. Now, also to testing scenarios, things were quite hard to actually, well, go ahead and test because each CPU is designed for a different task. So we'll actually get to what CPUs we ran. For our fewer, faster cores, we ran the Intel Pentium K or the uh, Intel Anniversary Edition, Intel Pentium Anniversary Edition, in fact, which we managed to overclock to 4.4 gigahertz. So that's a dual core processor at 4.4 gigahertz that we did overclock underwater with the same 12 gigs of RAM and a GeForce GTX 780 that we ran on our uh, other chip. Now, this is a fairly good chip, but it is coming in with a lower core count, so that is where it does let down. Now, for our multi-core chip, but slower cores, we have the Intel Xeon E5 2609 CPU. Now, we have this one right here, and it is a slower, but still a fairly decent six-core CPU. Coming in at 1.9 gigahertz with no overclocking available, it is, well, what it is. Now, now, you're probably asking, why do we pick this instead of our 980X or something else like that that we do have in-house? And the answer to that is fairly simple. We wanted to go with two fairly extremes. We went with the extreme of dual core, but still can go really fast. And we've gone with a little bit more of an extreme of a six core that goes fairly slow. Now, we could have jumped up to something like Intel's 18 core Xeon or even 12 core or like even 10 core, for example. But we wanted to keep this fairly realistic because this core is only, whoops, as I kind of drop it, only about three or so hundred dollars at the time of recording. So whilst it is fairly expensive for a CPU in general, it's not as expensive as something like the 18 core one which runs you upwards of $2,000. Now, with that, all the hardware that stayed the same was things like RAM and uh, video cards, hard drives, SSDs, those kind of things all stayed the same, but for our testing, we did run a few things. Now, I couldn't exactly run charts and those kind of things because it would be very one-sided, so I guess sort of a generalization of the results have to be made. Now, in terms of gaming, the Pentium absolutely crushed the Xeon for a number of reasons. Number one, the games that we were testing, including things like Sleeping Dogs Definitive Edition, Bioshock, and those things are more kind of single thread applications that do take advantage of a few more cores, but when we're getting into the six core space, it just couldn't take advantage of all those cores. The Xeon got crushed because of the fact it just couldn't run fast enough on the single core processor, and overall it's sort of better to go with that slower kind of option if you're doing things like video editing and stuff like that, which we'll come to in just a minute. Now in terms of actual compute and processing and stuff like that, I found the Xeon absolutely crushed the poor little Pentium, and again, I can't really put this into a graph because it'll be very one-sided, and the four tests that I did run two compute and two gaming each of them one each so it really comes down to what you're doing now if we go ahead and apply some you know uneducated logic to this and you're probably thinking at home where yeah, well the Pentium runs two 4.4 gigahertz CPUs giving it a total of 8.8 gigahertz and the Xeon has 1.9 gigahertz CPUs times six which means it'll be 11.4 gigahertz and that means it's 1.5 times better than the other one and it's even better right well even though that question was fairly confusing, the answer is no. Unlike what many people think where you could just sort of times each number by another number. So for example, the gigahertz times the cores, it does not work like that. And you shouldn't actually go ahead and times it like that. The reason for that is it doesn't always scale linear. Having a single core CPU at 4.4 gigahertz and then having another one, which is a quad core CPU at 4.4 gigahertz will not always give you better performance overall because it does come down to that single core performance. For example, Microsoft Office will not run four times 
runs better on that quad core 4.4 gigahertz processor as opposed to what it would run on the single core one. So do keep in mind that trying to multiply core speeds and those kind of things together, it doesn't work and you should not actually do that because basically just not how you go ahead and calculate these speeds. Now in some cases that might make a little sense but not exactly how it is. For example like compute tasks having a lot more cores will definitely help you there. For example rendering video out of Premiere Pro with this 6 core Xeon was a lot better than rendering video out of well the dual core Pentium because there was a lot more cores meaning it could do a lot more things at the same time as opposed to being bogged down on just two things at once every time it has a single clock. But at the end of the day the question does still remain is having slower cores better or having fewer faster ones and again it does come down to what you are doing for a gaming situation definitely having fewer cores because still at the moment we're running games that are taking advantage of one or two cores and if you're playing some older titles you'd be taking advantage of one core and having six of them lying around is just a complete waste of time for example the Pentium anniversary edition we had actually managed to match my i7 980x performance when I do my general benchmarks because I was only taking advantage of one core running at the same speed as my 980X. So power and performance of a higher end chip if you're only using one core, something like a fewer kind of faster core processor would definitely be a lot better. But when it comes to multi-core, multi-threaded performance and those kind of things, the Xeon does shine through because of the fact there's just a lot more cores there able to do a lot more things. So in all, if your software supports things like multi-core CPUs up to 12 or 24 cores, then definitely a higher core count CPU will definitely benefit you there. If you're just gaming and doing some light things like that, then the lower count CPU doesn't really matter. But for the general rule of thumb, try and go something in between the two extremes. Don't go all the way up to the extreme of lots of cores but slow ones, and don't go down to the extreme of having really fast cores but not many. Try and go something in between. Something like a four core CPU in this case would definitely do good all round because it will be able to render video and do compute tasks fairly well, but it will also too be able to game fast because there's less cores and it can still go pretty fast. So on that fairly confusing note, I guess I hope this has helped you in some way if it hasn't i'm sorry and if you have got more questions i'll be more than happy to answer them down below so guys like or dislike the video accordingly let me know what you would personally do would you go to the extreme of having lots of cores but slower ones or would you go down the line of having fewer sort of well faster cores and also to again give us a comment if you do have a question on this topic i will be more than happy to help you out there but at the end of the day it is a very hard topic to cover so guys thanks for watching don't forget to give us a sub if you like what we're doing and want to see more videos on core processors and those kind of things and I'll see you guys next time for another video.